Well, as always, it's great to be with you in church this morning. We are happy you're with us as we just open the Word of God and grow into this overflowing relationship with Jesus that he invites us into. And we're just so thankful that we get to do this together as a community. Uh, I know I, I love Sundays. I love that we get to gather together and go on this journey to, uh, in community. And so thank you so much for being here. We are starting a new series we're calling Unqualified, which I'm going to talk about that just in a couple moments. But before I do, as always, love to welcome those who are watching online. Uh, maybe you're tuning in from being away, you're not feeling well and staying connected to the church, or you're just checking out the church for the first time. We are just thrilled that you are able to be with us. We do pray that you would experience the same presence of the Spirit that we feel at home where you are at. But we do invite you to be in the room with us. We would love to meet you. And as good as it is online, it is better in the room. We have a 9 and 11 o'clock service. We'd love to meet you and see you. Or maybe you're in the room. Maybe you're here this morning. And maybe this first time with us. You've extended the invitation. You've received the invitation to join us. We're so happy you're here with us. And it is church is just better with you. That is just plain and simple. Come on, let's just welcome everyone who's here this morning. God is good. God is good. Just a couple quick announcements before we jump into our text today. The first is one, as always, all of our notes and, and uh, scriptures are available to you to follow along on your own, on your device, uh, the YouVersion Bible app under events. You can take your own notes and save them for later, so that's available towards for you there today. Also, coming up this Tuesday at, at 7 o'clock, we are hosting our Westlake Academy Parent and Partner Information Night for the last Almost two years, we've been, there's been a team of people praying into the idea of a Christian elementary school in Concordia. What would that look like? We're reading and seeing what's going on around us and asking this question, is God asking us to do something? And God is, I believe, preparing us and giving us a plan and a strategy. Uh, we have teachers and faculty in place, and we're preparing for a 2025 launch. And we want to let you know about it. We've been meeting with different churches all throughout the community the last couple of weeks. This is not a harbor initiative. This is a Christ-centered church initiative uh, that all the churches are partnering with. Uh, we believe this is for our community, provided and supported by our community. And uh, we want to invite you to come. If you're a parent of a young one or maybe your baby, you have a child, maybe two or three, and you're considering education or currently in the school system and want to know more about it, or hey, maybe you're here as a grandparent or just someone who just believes in Christian education and you want to partner with us in prayer, but also finances, and you want to just learn wh what this looks like, what's all about, come on out Tuesday night. If you just want to know because you want to talk about it and you want to talk about some information and some education, come on out and learn about it. We would love to meet you and to discuss what this could look like in our community by God's grace. And so that's a Tuesday night at 7 o'clock here at the church. Good? Everyone excited? Okay, God's good. All right, we're slowly getting there. It's all good. Uh, yeah, so awesome. We're in a series. So let's talk about unqualified. Unqualified. Here, let me ask you um, a couple questions as we just get started. Have you ever been or have you ever felt unseen, undervalued, uneducated, or unsure? Have you ever felt one of those things at some point in your life? I mean, I have. Daily, and in a lot of ways, especially in the heels of, you know, we just came off this series of I've decided to follow Jesus, to grow in Jesus, to go and do what Jesus did. And you're like, me? Like, do what Jesus did? Who, you know, I, I, I'm not sure I'm qualified for such a thing. You know, I, I'm sure all of us can relate to one or more of those feelings at some point in our life, especially when it comes to the things of God. Maybe you come to church or you sit in a Christian environment or even at home as you open God's word and you hear the call of God and you can see the need and you see, hey, we, somebody needs to do something and you even may be feeling moved by it, you're feeling compelled, but then just as quickly as you are feeling compelled to do something, just as quickly this rat race of lists and itemizations goes through your mind that says, but who are you? Who, who are you? You look at all the reasons why it can't be me. Surely somebody else, someone more talented, someone more, with more charisma or talent or, or, t or time or courage or experience or whatever, you can fill in the blank. Surely God can use them, but why would God ever choose to use me? Throughout Scripture, we see story after story, a moment after moment, encounter after encounter of God graciously inviting all kinds of people into meaningful relationships, and more than that, meaningful partnerships who we can relate to, 
Like we can relate to their story more than we even think. And so really over the next few weeks, what I'm hoping we can do together is look at some of these stories and explore God's invitation to all of those, all of us who feel unqualified and realize that there's actually, that God's quality is, pull, is, is leading us and directing us. Here's the big idea I read. I read, I read a book this, this summer, and this idea came out of this book, and I, and I loved it. I just kind of wrote it down. I was really starting this conversation, and the, the idea was that God can draw straight lines with crooked sticks. I loved it, because I feel like a cro- crooked stick a lot of times in my life. Like, I still, like, I don't have it all figured out. I'm still working through things, you know. But God is still able to use the crooked sticks of life, the crooked sticks of people, of circumstances, and draw straight lines and, and work out the things for, by his grace and for his glory. So whether you feel like a crooked stick or not today, there's good news for you. Maybe you feel like David, who penned this in Psalms 8, 3, uh, 8 verse 3, says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, here he's saying, what, am, who, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Who, who am I that you would even consider me? When I get a grasp of all that is happening around me, who am I that you would even consider me? See, most of the time, what do we do? We feel insignificant. We feel small. We feel in light of who God is. We just get this understanding. Because surely, we just don't measure up. And here's the through with that viewpoint and that perspective is that in the, right, in the right perspective and held rightly, it humbles us. It, it, that view in the right perspective, it humbles us. And as we walk in awe and the fear of the Lord, but that view held in wrongly hinders us and holds us back from living the life, the full purpose, the full purpose-driven life that God intended for us. And so... Today, we are going to tackle this question, this tension that I think a lot of us feel, I know I feel many times, it's this question, who am I? Who am I? In light of who God is, in light of what God is doing, in light of what he's asking us to be part of, who am I? This question we often ask ourselves as we disqualify ourselves from the situation. We disqualify ourselves from the obstacle. God, you, you want me to do what? You want me to do what? Surely I can't. Surely I'm not enough. Who am I? Who am I? Surely you've got the wrong person. Surely there's another person who can engage and you can use. See, many of us are good at pretending in the moment. We're good at putting on a face. We come to church on a Sunday, or we come to our small group, or we find ourselves in environments, and we're really good at pretending like we've got it all figured out, you know? We're really good at pretending that we've got everything locked and ordered, and we're, everything we're, that we're straight sticks. Mind you, we look at ourselves in the mirror, and we reveal the mask, we realize, hey, we got a lot of things we're just trying to navigate and work out. We got a lot of things we're trying to feel. We're we're battling through our insecurities. We're battling through our insufficiencies. We're battling through the things that we just cannot get right. And so today, what I want us to do is be able to look at Scripture and see what Scripture has to say about it. Because there's something I believe that Scripture can teach us for all of us who are wrestling through these insecurities of unqualification. That God is saying, no, no, I'm calling you and I've equipped you and can work in and through you. So we're going to explore the story some scriptures, and we're going to look at a story in the Old Testament, and then once we read through the story, we're going to extract some biblical principles that we can hopefully apply to our life. Sound good? Everyone with me? We're good? All right, God is good. All right, so we're going to look in the book of Judges. The book of Judges is in the Old Testament. It's a tragic story, tragic book. If you've never read it, I do invite you to read it. It's one of those books as a guy, if you've watched any sort of like war movie like Gladiator, like Braveheart, or any of those those kind of Roman era movies, you can visualize it because there's just a lot of battles and it's just really exciting because you can picture it in your mind. But here, let me set up the scene a little bit. Joshua, who took over leading the people of Israel after Moses passed away, Moses died. Joshua was now in leadership and he had led the Israelites into the promised land and he encouraged them in the promised land to remain faithful to the covenant of God by obeying the commandments of God, by obeying the law, the Torah of God. 
And so here we see uh, Joshua giving his people, this is what you need to do. Why? If you do this, he was saying, you will show the other nations what God is like as his faithful witnesses. I mean, you are now going to represent God among all the new people. See, the book of Judges, it starts with the death of Joshua, but then what it does is it tells the tragic tale of Israel's total failure. Israel's total failure. Before Israel was even a nation, before they had kings, God appointed judges. And these were not like legal judges who sat behind a bench. But these were like more like, mil- like tribal leaders. They were more like militant-minded strategic thinkers who would lead the people of Israel to help drive out the other nations that, got that, um, that were in the land that God had given them. And the whole point of driving out the other nations, the whole point of conquering the taking of the land is that they would not become like the other nations. That they would be a people that were set apart for God. That they would not worship other gods. That they would not fall into moral corruption. God knew that if you stay too far in the land, you will be influenced by the people. They will, they will incorporate themselves into your living and thinking. And Joshua came into the promised land and he drove out some of the nations, but he wasn't able to drive them all out before he died. And so Joshua raised up, so there, God raised up judges to help do this. But the book of Judges tells this tra- tragic tale of each judge going from pretty good to good to bad to worse. If you really just want to read a tragic tale, Judges is a really good book to read. And here we see in Judges chapter 2, this sort of repeating plot line that you see throughout the whole book of Judges. It starts off, but the Israels would sin against God by becoming like the other nation. Exactly what God told them not to do. So they would, they would start off by sinning against God, and then God would allow them to be conquered and oppressed by that nation. Eventually, Israel would see the error of their ways and repent, and then God would raise up a deliverer or a judge among the people of Israel, one of the tribes of Israel. This judge would then defeat the enemy and bring an era of peace for Israel. But eventually, Israel would sin again, and the downward spiral would start all over. And here we see through the whole story of Israel, the whole story of Judges, the the cycle that Israel is in. Today, we are going to zoom in and look at one of those judges, a judge named Gideon. A judge named Gideon. And uh, I would love to say that Gideon's story is a great story, but there's a lot of truth in it, a lot of things we can glean from it, but it's still a tragic tale, as all the judges are tragic. But there's things we can learn through the story of Gideon that we're going to hope to lean in today. Let's start with Gideon chapter 6. We're going to read the story. It's a great story, tragic story, visual story, and we're going to learn from it. Here it is in verse 6, chapter 1, it'll be on the screen. It says, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So here we see the top of the plot line, right? They're sinning against God, okay? Bad spot to start. For seven years, then God handed them over, right? So seven years that God gave them to the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in the mountains, the clefts, and the caves, and the strongholds. I mean, they were so oppressive, they had to hide. They were just hiding, Whenever Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, the Amalekites, and other Easternites, all the other people uh, people invaded the country, and they camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkey. And they came up with their livestock and they plant and their tents like a swarm of locusts. Can you imagine an army so big it just feels like a swarm of locusts? It was impossible to count them on their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that, here, remember, here they are in the cycle, they cried out for God's help. They repented. So here, let's take a pause real quick in the story and just kind of get ourselves around the situation. So here we again, if you read the story of Judges, you see that there's a word again. It's like, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Again, the Israelites did evil in the So here we are in one of these again moments, right? They're in the cycle. Again, the Israelites, again, they're disobeying God. They're doing exactly what God told them not to do by worshiping other gods of the people in the land, by living an immoral life, by having other gods before him, by worshiping the gods of the Malachites. And so God, by his sovereignty and justice, gave them into the hands of the Midianites for seven years. They were oppressed. And, and this is something we don't fully understand, but God in his sovereignty allowed them to be persecuted, cut this, cut, face discomfort, trials, even death. He allowed them to experience the cause and effect 
of their consequences, the con- cause and offense consequences of their choices of turning against God. Now, the Midianites were not the type of people that you wanted to be subservient to. Uh, they were a vicious people. Just to help paint a picture, as I was studying, the Midianites were the type of people that they would take their captives and they would take a big hook and drive it through their nose, through the top of their mouth, and hook it onto a, a bunch of chains with all the other captives. So you're held by chains through a hook through your nose and to the top of your mouth. And this is what you were treated. You were just treated like an object. You were treated, they were just, there was no grace. They had no compassion. Everything they had, they just took it. They destroyed crops. They slaughtered livestock. They were not, they were not, this was not a good scene. And for all intents and purposes, the situation was bad. You know, let's just pause for a second. It's easy to read stories like this and just read about Gideon and read about Israel and look about their situations. But what we do need to do is we just see how scripture reveals us and our situation in our life and you know, a lot of times we find ourselves in moments like this where the situation just looks bad. It just looks bleak. We find ourselves hiding. We find ourselves cowarding. We find ourselves doing things we shouldn't be doing just to kind of keep our head down and get out of the way. And I think we can see ourselves a little bit in Gideon's story. You know, when we think about the desperation, the destitution of the situation. And, you know, we have grace for him because we see ourselves a little bit in the situation many times in our life. Just keep reading on. So the people cried out to Israel, and the people of Israel rather cried out to God, and God heard their prayer, and he sent help. Chapter 11, I mean, verse 11, it says, Then the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak of Oprah that belonged to Joash, uh, Joash and the Ab- um, Aberazite. Aberazite? Aberazite? Something sounds good. One thing I want to point out, not my, not my reading, but the other point is... Um, the angel of the Lord. When you see the text, the angel of the Lord, the capital, capital Lord, this is, refer- this is what they call, the theologians call the Christophany. This is when it's actually not just an angel like Gabriel or Michael, but this is actually Jesus. This is actually the, the, the person Jesus coming down and visiting the people in the Old Testament. And so here's what you see. It's not just that God sent a messenger. No, God sent himself, Jesus, to come and reveal himself to Gideon. I think that's really special. So Jesus, and so God, the angel of the Lord comes and says, the angel of the Lord appeared to Gordon and says, the Lord is with you. And here's what he says, mighty warrior. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Here's what he finds. He finds him threshing wheat in a wine press to keep away from the Midian. So here's a guy who is frared. He's afraid. He's, he's, he's so scared. He's doing something that does not even make sense. So he's actually threshing wheat in a wine press to hide himself and to hide the plunder so that they can eat and they can survive. And so he's cowardly, he's secretive, he's small, he's, he's doing something in secret, and God shows up to him, reveals to him, and he says, you are a mighty warrior. You can just imagine the shock and awe that you and I would all feel in that moment. He says, pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, then why has this happened? Many of us have asked that kind of question, haven't we? Where are all the wonders that our ancestors told us about when they, when they said, did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us to the hand of the Midianites. Just push pause for a second. Isn't it amazing how we have a perspective that when we did evil in the eyes of the Lord, how we abandoned God, our perspective is that God abandoned us. And here we see Israel in this cycle where they're abandoning the ways of God. But their perspective and their viewpoint is because who, you know, we're not, we're not the bad person. We're not the wrong ones. That God abandoned us. And we're a lot like Gideon too, aren't we? Where were you, God? He's like, I've been here the whole time. Where were you, you know? Where were you? That's not my sermon, but that's just a side point. There's so many of them in the story of Gideon, we don't have time to get into them all. The Lord told him, the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have, which is hilarious because here he is hiding. What strength does he have? He's hiding. Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of the Midian's hands. Am I not sending you? And then his response is one that would all have a, Excuse me? Excuse me? You know, what are you talking about? Pardon me? How can I save Israel? Who am I? How can, how, you're, me? Not, not, not our tribal leader, not the strong ones, not the military leaders. You're, ask, you're asking me? And then he goes on. He said, my clan is the weakest of Manasseh. Manasseh is one of the, tri- the 12 tribes of Israel. I'm, my clan is one of the weakest of our tribe, and our tribe is the weakest of Israel, and we're the least family, we're the least. And, and the Lord says, I will be with you. And you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving no one alive. So here is Gideon. God's asking him to do something extravagant, do something big. 
And Gideon here is hiding cowardly, and the Lord speaks to the potential of who he is, not, what he, not who he is now, but who he could be. He says, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with you. And here Gideon is, he just can't fathom it. He's like us, using all these excuses. He's like, who am I? What do I have to offer? I'm weak. No one knows me. Who will follow me? I don't have credentials. I have no past success. How can I do it? And many of us find ourselves in those scenarios. I know I have many times. You want me to what? You want us to start a Christian school? What? I was horrible at school. They never asked me that when they interviewed me, but just so you know, it was horrible. <laughs> Suck us. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> yeah, but often, God, I find myself in these moments like, you, what? What do you want us to do? Where are you, where are you leading us? And we often can feel like, who am I? Who are we? You know, we're, we're in Concordan. We're a small little town, country town. We love the church. We love the beach. It's all good. You want us to do what? You want us to change the world? Right? Come on now. I'm not, surely I'm not the only one who has these thoughts. Surely I'm not the only one who has to wrestle that demon, you know, in my mind. Here we are. We're like Gideon. You know, a lot of us, we just, we're just trying to just stay ordinary. We just want to, we, we just don't believe that God has given us anything but just an ordinary life. And so all we do is we just keep our head down, stay out of trouble, don't get noticed, don't take any heat, don't take a bullet. You know, let's just stay down. Keep your head out of the way. Don't take any chances. And guess what? We'll never also do anything great. <laughs> I'm reminded of Moses, how Moses, uh, God revealed himself to Moses in the form of a burning bush, and he's just in the wilderness. He's basically just living a life, just in exile. And God's like, no, I've called you to, I'm calling you to go back. And he couldn't even believe that God would use him in all of his insecurities and imperfections. Like this story is a repeating story throughout Scripture. And here we see that Gideon goes through this belabored process of confirming the word of God. <laughs> and we don't have time to get into it, but if you read the story, you realize that he does all of these tricks and all of these, like, well, testing and testing to see if God's actually speaking to him and he's actually not just had some bad pizza the night before, that he's actually hearing the word of God, you know? I'm seeing what I'm seeing. I'm hearing what I'm hearing. And throughout this whole process, finally he gets it. Finally he understands I'm going to synthesize the story for you. And so he, he goes through the story, and then he finally agrees. He finally uh, agrees to go and be the, the voice piece of God or to be the armor of God, to be a judge, the rising up the judge. And he goes to the people of Israel, and he's able to muster 32,000 soldiers from the people of Israel. Sounds like a great army. Sounds like a big group of people until you compare it to the army of the Midianites, which Scripture doesn't give us a number, but they give us some description. They say, as many as locusts and sand on a shore... So we're not talking a number. We're talking a number that cannot be counted. So for argument's sake, just for fun, let's just put, let's give it a number. Let's give it 100,000. Just for argument's sake. This is like a, an army that just, it's, you can't even see how many people there are. It's 100,000 people. And so you got three Israelite soldiers versus, uh, so you got one Midianite soldier versus, hang on a second, one Israelite soldier versus three Midianite soldiers. My hands are all twisted up. One versus three. Okay, so the situation is not looking too good, but God's still going to get the glory. Okay, not looking too great, but the odds aren't horrible. We've got to be strategic. We've got to be, we've got to be better. So then we keep on the story in verse, Judges chapter 7, 1. It says, early in the morning, Gabriel, I'm um, Gabriel, Gideon, and all of his men jumped, uh, camped at the spring Herod, and the camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Moriah. Morai. And the Lord said to Gideon, remember the, remember the, the ratio, you have too many men. Just imagine that conversation. You have too many resources. You're standing there feeling empty-handed, but God's saying, you've got, still got too much. He says, I cannot deliver Midian in their hands, or Israel will boast against me. My own strength has saved me. What's God saying? God's saying, hey, I'm going to get the glory in this one. If, you, if I let you keep going the way you're going to, you're going to think you did this in your own strength. And we see where your strength gets us. It says, now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount, leave Mount Gilead. Can you just imagine, hey, if you're afraid, we've got that monster army that's been, you know, imprisoning us and oppressing us for, ten, for seven years. If you're afraid and you don't want to fight, go home. That's what he does. And 10,000, I mean 20,000 men leave. 20,000 men, 22,000 men leave, leaving 10,000 remaining. Now the, now the ratio is 10 to 1. 10 to 1, just if you like the math. I like it. 
But Gideon, but the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Like just, yeah, it's crazy. Take them down to the water and I'll, st- and I'll thin them out from there. If I say this one go there and that one should go, that one should go, then he will go. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There the Lord told them, separate those who lap the water with their tongues and as a dog laps from those who kneel down and drink. 300 of them drank from the cupped hands, laughing like dogs. The rest got down on their knees to drink. So here Gideon is forced, being led by the Lord, to send another 21,700 soldiers home, leaving himself with 300 mighty men, faith-filled men, who are going to tackle 100,000 Midianite soldiers. 333 to 1, if you're doing the math. And what looks like a setback in this situation, what looks like a setback in the story of Israel, is actually a setup for God's glory alone. And what looks like in the natural, in the natural, all the odds are stacked against him. It's not looking too good for his army. And just imagine yourself in this situation. Imagine yourself, and probably you know what it looks like. Probably you, maybe you never have been in a battle against 100,000 Midianites on camels. That's probably not part of your story. But maybe you've been in a situation where you felt like all the odds are stacked against you. Maybe you found yourself in a situation where you were the only one standing up for what was right. And everyone else was bending a knee. Maybe you found like yourself and you're the only one who, it's like whether you're a battle at home or your work or your school place, and you feel like everything's stacked against you. You feel like you're standing alone, staring into a face of a thousand Midianite soldiers, waiting and wanting to take you out, you find yourself like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who are the only ones standing when everyone else is bowing. And you're like, God, what are you asking me to do? And it's in moments like these where you have to throw your emotions out the door. You, have to, you can't just trust what you feel in the moment, but you've got to rely on the faithfulness of God. I've discovered that emotions, while great indicators, are horrible leaders. We cannot be led by our emotions. We are led by our decisions, what we talked about last week, right? Emotions are great indicators of what's going on, but we cannot be led by our emotions. I imagine Gideon was rustling through how he felt about the situation and what he was called to do in the situation. In the moments like these, we're, we're meant to, we, have, we can't rely on what looks natural. We have to believe in the God of the supernatural. Is there ordaining every step that you take? It's in moments like these where you need to dig deep and make the choice to pursue and persevere. And here's what Gideon did. Gideon made that choice. And we read the story knowing that God was with him, that God had set him up for success. He followed the leading of the Lord and he devised a plan. Chapter 16, we see that dividing the 300 men into three companies, listen to this. He placed trumpets, empty jars in their hands, and torches. He did not give them swords and catapults and spears, And flaming arrows, he gave them trumpets and jars and torches. Can you just imagine what the 300 men must have felt like? And he says, watch me and follow my lead. Watch me and follow my lead. I love how it just references Paul saying, follow me as I follow Christ. He's like, hey, follow me. Just follow me. Follow my lead. And when you get to the edge of the camp, go do exactly as I do. And when, when I and all of you or when, uh, wait, sorry, when I and all who are with me ba- uh, blow our trumpets, then all around the camp blow yours and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. Let's pause there for a second. We're going to come back to that in the end. Weird statement. Why Gideon lumps himself into the glory of the Lord. I could preach on that for a second, but I, it just he's inserting himself into the glory. Which right there tells you this is not going to end well for Gideon. If you read the story, it should be just for the Lord, but he inserts himself. For the Lord and for Gideon. Gideon and a hundred men had reached out to the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle of the watch, just after the, the guards had chef, uh, changed the guard. They blew their trumpets and broke the jars that were in their hands, and 300 companies blew their trumpets and smashed their jars, grasping the torches in the left hand, holding their, the trumpets in the right hand, they're about to blow, and they shouted for the, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon, and they blew the trumpets, and each looked in the sixth line. And while each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. This beautiful story is 
these men, these 300 men, in an unconventional strategic tactic, surrounded the camp with trumpets and horns and torches and just blew and waved and made a sound and caused chaos and struggle around them. And it would have been easy for them to run and to hide, but they held their ground. I love this picture, this man holding. It's like, I think of that army. It's like, hold, you know, hold. Stand your ground. Paul tells us in Ephesians, he says, put on the full army of God that you may be able to stand firm against the devil's schemes. First Corinthians, Paul tells us to be on guard, stand firm in your faith, be courageous and be strong. I love to say that the story of Gideon and Israel's faithfulness to God's covenant grows from here, but unfortunately, as I've already hinted, the story does not end in, in victory. It actually begins this, the downfall of another tragic spiral for Gideon and for the people of Israel which is a story for another day. But there's enough in this part of the story that we can glean from as we understand who we are and what God asks us to do and to be part of it. And I believe that there are several biblical, biblical principles that we can draw from, but for today's sake, I want to just draw attention to three in our time we have left. The first is this, that God is faithful even when we're not. The God is faithful even when we're not. Some of us need to be reminded that today, that God is faithful even when I'm not. This is good news for all of us, no matter what brought us here, no matter the circumstances of our life or the situations of our life, that God is faithful. No matter what I have done, no matter what I haven't done, God is faithful. When, I, when, I, when we're unfaithful, when we're hiding, when we're trying to stay unnoticed, God is faithful. When we've been disobedient and we've been unfaithful to the covenant of God, God is faithful. It should be a reminder for us that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change as shifting sands, but he is faithful. I love how Paul describes it to Timothy. Here's a, a trustworthy saying that if we are unfaithful, that God remains faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. Like, this is the nature of God. In the same way that God is love, God is faithful. He is reliable. He is trustworthy. He is true. We may have abandoned him, but God will never abandon you. I need to hear that. You may abandon him. You may turn. You may walk in your own ways, but God will never abandon you. We cannot say with confidence, with biblical confidence, where, where did you go? Why did you abandon us? We can't, God does not abandon you. you aban we abandon him. He is faithful. So we can hold on to this biblical principle, no matter who you are, no matter what you're going through, no matter what's happened in your life, no matter how insignificant or unqualified you feel, we, if you put your faith in God, he is faithful. Second principle we can hold on to is that with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. God can use 300 faith-filled soldiers armed with trumpets, empty torches, and empty jars and defeat an army of over 100,000 mean Midianites. Like, he can do that. And I love how this statement, I, I, I love how God says, it, do, it, it does not make sense, rather. It doesn't make sense in the natural, and it's not common sense because God is not common. I love how Jesus says to the people of of, of, of Israel when he was when Jesus was walking the earth and he's looking at situations he's asking him to do things that just seem impossible and hard to even wrap your head around and Jesus responds to the disciples inquire inquiry and he says yeah humanly speaking what I'm asking you to do is impossible but with God all things are possible with God all things are possible and I love the invitation because Jesus could have said hey for God all things are possible. And that statement would have been equally as true. For God, all things are possible. But what Jesus is doing to his disciples, what Jesus does to us now, and what Jesus, what the, the, the angel of the Lord spoke to Gideon, he says, I'm going to be with you. He says, with God, all things are possible. Meaning, I'm asking you to do something. We're going to do this in partnership together. Sure, I can do all the heavy lifting. I'm going to do most of the heavy lifting, but we're going to be in this together. It reminds me of a biblical equation that Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Jesus plus nothing equals anything. I mean that Jesus brings everything to the table. We bring nothing to the table but faith and obedience, and God provides everything else 
we need. But the opposite of that is true, is that we can have everything. We can have all the talent, the charisma. We can have everything without Jesus, and it equals nothing. It equals nothing of any eternal value. You may have short-term monumental success, but you will not have eternal reward. And so here we are invited into this, part, this partnership that, yeah, I know I'm not bringing anything to the table. I, I don't have much to take. Like, who am I? Who am I? I'm the least of the least of the least. I don't have anything to offer. And Jesus is like, I don't need anything. I just need your obedience. I just need your faith. And here's the next principle. When we walk in obedience, we can trust the outcome to God. So when we walk in that obedience, we say, God, i got nothing to bring except my faith that you are God and my obedience to do what you're asking me to do. All I have to, that's all I have to bring. And God says, I can take your obedience and I'll worry about the outcome. There's a model that I have adopted into my life this last couple years as God continues to speak to us and speak to me and ask me to do hard things. Because often I feel like Gideon. And I've just adopted this mindset, I'm just going to do it scared. Just gonna do it scared. I'm not fearful, because God's not giving me the spirit of fear, but I love power and sound mind. So I'm, doing, I'm not fearful, but I'm gonna do it scared, meaning I don't really know what's gonna happen. <laughs> I don't really know how this is all gonna work out. I'm not really sure I have all the right things in place, but I'm gonna be faithful to do what you're asking me to do today and trust that you'll, you'll take care of my tomorrow. And so here we're just committed to doing it scared. I'm committed, and my team, and we talk about this a lot, is say, hey, we're gonna work like it all depends on us, but then we're going to pray like it all depends on God. Because unless God shows up, our work is in vain anyway. So we need God to show up. It's why we pray on Tuesday mornings at 8 o'clock. There's a plug. two o'clock, Because we just cannot do all the work. We can plan, we can plan, we can plan. But if we're not praying, or we're not putting our full, relate, or our full dependence on God, what are we doing? We're wasting our time. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. Here's what I know. Understanding can wait. Obedience cannot. We may not understand what God is asking us to do. Gideon, I'm sure, did not understand the plan. He just keeps on taking my army away. He's, giving, he's taking away my swords and giving me torches. I don't understand the plan. And I can be, I can not understand, but I cannot be disobedient. I need to be obedient to the plan. You may not fully understand why. You're like, why me? And that's okay. I mean, Isaiah 55 says that his thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. And so every one of us as followers of Christ need to come to this awareness or come to this recognition that either God is God of all or he's not God at all. You staying with me? Everyone's with me still? Either God is God of all or he's not God at all. We cannot be in the middle where he's God of these things but not God of those things. He's God of this situation, but he's not God of this situation. He's God of this, this person in my family, but he's not God. Like either he's God of all or he's not God of all, at all. And we have to come to that moment that Joshua had to ask, you know, you, you serve who you want to serve, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Like you need to come to that kind of conviction that I'm going to declare him God of all. And when you come to that declaration, when you come to that moment to declare him God of all, then the only response we have is to live a life of full surrender and obedience. It's the only option we have. If he is God of all, then we are called to be obedient to his lordship. Even when he asks you to do things that scare you or you don't understand. When he asks you to step out in faith and, and, and to talk to someone, to pray for someone, to lead something, to serve someone, and you don't understand, you're like, who am I? You just like, no, I'm trusting in you. I love this verse in 1 Corinthians 1.27. Paul says, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And he chose the weak things to shame the strong. Why? Because God wants the glory. It's all for him anyway. God wants the glory. The outcome has nothing to do with me. The outcome has nothing to do with the harbor. The outcome has everything to do with the name of Jesus being exalted and being lifted up. And so I don't, why do I need to worry about the outcome? It's not my responsibility. Just the name of Jesus is my response, to lift up that name. And so here's a thought I want you to hold on to today, whether you, maybe you feel unqualified, maybe you feel you're just unseen, you just don't have what it takes. Here's what I want you to know, is that God does not call the qualified, but he qualifies those he calls. That God is not a respecter of persons, meaning he doesn't see what we see. 
A lot of times what we do when we're picking our team, you know, if you're the captain, if you're just picking the most talented people, the visually most athletic, you're just picking the right people. God doesn't see what we see. He sees the heart of people. He sees the potential. He sees the gifts and the creation that he planted inside of them from the beginning of time. He placed inside of He saw something in Gideon that not even his family members saw in him. He calls it out. And when God calls you, what does he do? He gifts you with the spiritual gifts, but he also gifts you with grace and strength to live out and fulfill the call. But we have to activate it. We have to submit ourselves to his lordship. So here's the question. If God equips the called, what is God calling you to do? What has God been speaking to you about? What has God been stirring in your heart? What has God depositing into your spirit? What thought can't you not let go? What call, what dream, what idea, what motion, what movement, what way of spreading the gospel of grace? What way of sharing Jesus, what way of advancing the kingdom of God has God deposited into your heart and to your life that you cannot shake what you keep on fighting and resisting against? What is he calling you to? The question is, what you have to ask yourself, what is he asking me to do? And then you have to serve, like, well, what faith do I need to activate to actually do that? And what doubt or what fear, what fear of unqualification do I need God's help to overcome? So you work through that. And then here's kind of the thought I want you to consider. Maybe instead of just looking at who we are and putting our attention on who we are, what if we just start believing whose we are? Instead of just thinking who we are, what if we start believing whose we are? Say, yeah, I know I'm not, but God can. I know I'm not able to, but God is able to. I know I'm weak, but he is strong. In fact, Paul says, I can boast about my weakness because in my weakness, his power is made complete in me. So we have these moments, yeah, it's not about who I am, but it's about whose I am. And so practically speaking today, maybe you're here, like God's speaking to you, and he's like, maybe, hey, it's time to join a team. Maybe it's time to lead his group. Maybe it's time to share Jesus with a friend. Maybe it's time to pray with your spouse or your children. Maybe it's time to accept the invitation to be known and to know God by prayer and reading his Bible. Maybe what is God speaking to you about? And what limitations are you putting on yourself? Here is the hope that all of us can hold on to today is that God is in the business of drawing straight lines with crooked sticks. And that anything submitted into the hands of God is enough. So will you allow him? We hold on to the principle. We hold on to the principle that God is faithful even when you're not. That with God all things are possible. And that we're simply to walk in faith and obedience and trust the outcome to him. Who are we? If you've accepted him and called him Lord, you are a child of God. And if God is for you, who can be against you? In Jesus' name, let's pray. Just allow the moment to sit for a second as the Spirit of God speaks to our hearts. I can only imagine, and I don't want to say it with 100% confidence, but I'd be pretty confident to believe that God has been speaking to many of you here today. Not even just this morning, but even this last week. Stirring things, depositing things. Making you not, uh, allowing you not to think about anything else, but just about some initiatives that would advance the kingdom of God. And you've been wrestling with it. You've been fighting against it. You've been wondering, who am I? And I just believe this word of the Lord says that you are his. You're a mighty warrior. You've been called. You've been set apart. You've been anointed and appointed for this time, for this place, for this space. To lead by the grace of God for the glory of God. Instead of wrestling with who you're not, the word of the Lord is saying, hey, why don't you just allow me to say who you are? So this morning, God, we just submit ourselves to your leadership and your lordship. We ask you, Spirit, to make your word come alive in us. Give us the courage and the faith to be obedient to your leadership, to the unction of your spirit, to the nudging of your spirit. Remind us of God that when we walk, we do not walk alone, but we walk in the grace and the power 
of God. So we just thank you that you're with us. Speak to us, God. May we be people who walk in faith and obedience, who work with you to accomplish good things and rely on the faithfulness of God. We submit our hearts to you today and this week in your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen.